name. Amen. 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 Okay, so um, just a little bit of explanation on how we got here today. Um, You can see the new title of the series for the next three weeks is called Coasting. Coasting. Last week, um, I shared a phrase with you, God expects Jesus followers to follow Jesus. Seems really basic, doesn't it? But it's actually life-transforming. God expects Jesus followers to actually follow Jesus. Amen? Second service. Amen? Like, I'm going to need this today. Um, Yeah, he expects it, and and he doesn't uh, exempt us from following Jesus. We don't just embrace um, feelings or philosophy or a church attendance. We don't just put the bumper sticker on our card. Um, Like we walk with Jesus for real. God does not exempt us from that. And the reason he doesn't is because he loves us enough that he wants us to actually change. Um, He does not pre-excuse us because he loves us enough to take away our excuses. And we're pretty good at excuses. Um, God expects Jesus followers to follow Jesus. And then he expects us to fail. (laughs) And he expects to have to forgive us. Sounds weird to say he expects us to fail, doesn't it? But doesn't he know us? Aren't we going to need his forgiveness over and over and over again every moment of our lives? So he knows he's going to have to give us the strength to walk with Jesus. He knows he's going to have to pick us up when when we fall. The grace of God is going to have to forgive us, have to inspire us, have to keep us going along this walk with Jesus. We need his grace and his power every step of the way. But God expects Jesus followers to follow Jesus. And as we do, and as that clumsy process of the Christian life goes, step by step by step, God is one centimeter at a time reshaping you into the image of Jesus Christ. Not into who you are today. The the Bible calls this process sanctification. It's, it's salvation, but it's, it's the lifelong process of sanctification where we follow Jesus, learn about Jesus, get changed to be more like Jesus this year than we were last year. And we want that, desperately want that. Do you desperately want that? So I'd put a little um, outline together. We, had, we got three weeks before the Christmas series starts. Put a little outline together of of a financial series um, that we could have done that would have talked to you about what the Bible has to say about your money going into Christmas as a family so you don't have to show up in January and be all in debt like we often are. And I was going to teach you how to do that. I'm not going to anymore. Um, Instead, we're going to do that series in January. So please don't get in debt between now and January. (laughs) And we'll tell you why when we get there. Um, (laughs) <laughs> Instead, we're going to take the next three weeks and we're going to do this thing called coasting um, because we were talking on Tuesday in the preaching team meeting and Pastor Tanner said, sometimes uh, as a church, we're coasting. Sometimes as Christians, we're coasting. And what's coasting? Coasting is you don't have your foot on the gas pedal anymore, right? Like the engine isn't helping you have momentum. Instead, you're just, you're just uh, riding the momentum of the past, coasting. And uh, if you've been following us the last few weeks, God's been doing something real interesting in us as a preaching team the last few weeks. Um, I talked about it last week a bit that um, Linda and I were in California. We heard Pastor Tanner giving his talk. and We just felt like there was, there was a, something very special that the Holy Spirit was doing in that message. And then uh, last week, um, I tried to bring you the second part of that. And we kind of thought it was done and let's move on to the Christmas money series. And, and instead, we got to Tuesday and we're like, maybe God isn't done with this yet. And if you were here last week, we talked about the fact that God expects Jesus followers to follow Jesus. And then we talked about the early church and we talked about people who their faith was so on fire guys that they were willing to sacrifice and to love and to even die for their faith. And we looked at the historical information about how that actually worked for them. And man, if you're like me, I felt the heat off of their faith by the end of that. Do you feel the heat? 
Uh, it's, it's, be, it's, it's past inspiration. It's, it, it's the kind of thing that you feel convicted that your faith doesn't look like that faith. And oh God, how do I get my faith to look like that faith? Because I want to not be about me and I want to love other people for real the way Jesus did and then the way his early church actually did. And how do I get that? And so we got to Tuesday and, and, and we're praying about it. We're like, God, I, I, like, I don't think you're done with this topic yet. And so we're going to take the next three weeks and we're going to do this thing called coasting. And how do we not coast? Because we don't want to. Today's a rededication service. It's, it's step one in this process. So we're going to have time at the end of this service. And I'm going to do an old-fashioned altar call, folks. And I'm going to ask you to come to the stage. And I'm going to ask you to, because it costs you to do that. I'm going to ask you to pray a prayer of rededicating your whole life and your whole faith and everything you own and are back to Jesus all over again. You feeling the tension in the room? Right? There's tension. It's because you're starting to face that. Um, Please do face it. Please start to prepare your heart. You've got 20 minutes or so to do it. (laughs) Or so. We'll see. I've tried to plan a smaller message. (laughs) Emphasis on try. Um, Tried to plan a smaller message so that you have plenty of time at the end. And Pastor Tanner's going to sing a song, and and you're going to have time for just you and God to come to this stage. Please prepare your heart. It will be a holy time for us. So why is the fire burned out? Revelation chapter 2, verse 2. If you've got your Bibles, if you're taking notes, that's where we're going first. Your love for God burned out, Revelation 2. Um, This is Jesus. This this passage I'm about to read to you, this is one of the letters that Jesus wrote to the local churches at the beginning of the book of Revelation. He wrote these letters to seven different local churches with seven different congregations, seven different uh, strengths and weaknesses. Um, And he wrote this letter to them, and here's one of them. Verse two, he says, I know the things that you do. I've seen your hard work and your patient endurance. I know you don't tolerate evil people. You have examined the claims of those who say they are apostles, but are not. You have discovered they are liars. You have patiently suffered for me without quitting. Jesus is writing to Christians here. He's talking to people who know God and are saved. And what he just gave you as far as their resume as a church looks pretty good, doesn't it? Like they've done a lot of really great stuff. Like it sounds a bit so far like that early church experience we were talking about last week. But, verse four, but I have this complaint against you. He says, you don't love me or each other as you did at first. Some of your translations say you lost your first love. Look how far you have fallen. Turn back to me and do the works you did at first. If you don't repent, I will come and remove your lampstand from its place among the churches. That's some hard truth at the end, isn't it? He's saying if you're a church and you're doing so many good things, but the love is gone, I don't know that you're an effective church anymore. Jesus just spells it out. So all of a sudden, loving God and having actual love for God. It's not optional. Not in his mind, it's not. You can't go forward without it. And some of us have decided to go forward without it. We have. Like I used to love him when I first got saved and I was all filled with joy and I was telling everybody, I, everybody with a pulse, I was telling them about Jesus, right? Like, and I was giving him anything that he wanted and I'd do anything for him. And there was just this this rush of all of this stuff and I loved God. And then somewhere along the line, I became a church person. And I thought the love part was optional and none of us ever decide to do it. it. Just happens a centimeter at a time to us. How could we possibly fall away from this love of God? Do you love him? Do you love him? What do you love about him? I need you to remember what you love about him. (laughs) There's there's some of us in marriages today, and I'm really going to poke you here. Um, And we married a person, and we're in a spot where we forgot why we married him. 
Don't look at him right now, please, <laughs> for your own sake. But you need to go back and remember. You need to reacquaint yourself with what caught your attention and sent you that thrill, yeah? Here's a, here's a list. I made a list of why we love God. It's a short list. His quiet voice that doesn't shout above the chaos and the loudness of this world, but instead he brings that still quiet voice that waits for me to lean in and listen and to seek him. Do you love that about Jesus? I could take some amens here. You could absolutely do that. Um, his truth that changes me slowly and imperceptibly, but surely, and it does not overwhelm me. His love that holds me more securely than any other love in my life, all the betrayals, all the people who've gotten so sick of me, they were just, they were just done with me. He was never done with me. Amen. Now, oh, oh, love that will not let me go. This is this hymn from the 1800s. Everyone else might let me go, but you won't let me go. His forgiveness that woos me to him and refuses to threaten me to compliance. His forgiveness that's 100% complete and I don't have to worry about some little corner of my past in shame that his cross did not cover. No, his forgiveness is 100%. His forgiveness that lets me into the future, take risks for Jesus in ministry and in conversations and, and knows that he's got me because he knows my future sin as well. His wisdom that brings peace in this world that is so addicted to chaos. The way he's close and personal and he knows my name and he knows the number of hairs on my head. And Revelation says he's even got a new name that he's given just to me. And he, he's etched it on this white stone and only he and I will know it. It's how personal he is. Do you love him? Do you love him? His freedom from the habits and behaviors that tie me up in knots. His freedom from the lies that I used to believe and those things made me wrong and small and ugly because I believed those lies and he's brought correction to it. The beauty that I see in every sunset and in the faces of my kids, that's his beauty. Like I love that about God. His beauty that I see in all the cultures and, and the colors of every single nation and tribe and tongue that will all gather together in white robes around the throne of God. Finally, one unified family. I see beauty in that. His miracles that are big and small remind me of just how big he is and how in control he is. His grace that saved me, even though I'm prone to wonder, right? The, the hymnists again, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God that I love. Even in the here and now, there's a reason the love dies because we're prone to wonder and he just keeps loving us. Amen. His grace that gently calls me back. What do you love most? I could have made a bigger list. I told you I was trying to preach shorter. It could have gone on. What's your favorite? Reacquaint yourself with what draws you to Jesus. Right? Like what makes you love him? What makes you in love with him? Can we just recapture that from the romantic realm for just a minute? And can we just say that someone can have a walk with Jesus Christ that is so passionate and central in their life? We call it being in love, even though it's not romantic. Right? Like, where'd it go? How did you lose it? How did I lose it? Because it happens. Uh, there was a pastor that um, told me this story, and he had had this vision from God. And the way the vision went is there was this ocean liner that was traveling uh, along the ocean and, and there was the lines behind it, you know, the wake behind it. And you could see that it was moving and, and God asked the pastor, he says, I want you to see that ocean liner. He's like, he, he's like, guess what? It's engine died five miles back because that's what goes on in the church. 
is it feels like we're going and we're not going. It feels like everybody else looks at us from the outside and they're like, it looks like I'm seeing progress, but you know here. Here, the engine isn't going anymore. And how do we get back that back? Because the fire that has gone out can be reignited by Jesus. Amen. Right? Like this isn't, this isn't a depressing message. <laughs> like Jesus is here and wants to reignite you. Right. Yes. right? Like it's only sad if there's no option. Oh, no, there's more than an option. There's a guarantee if you'll ask him. Jesus wants to reignite faith. You know, I, I asked a group of people yesterday that, that they would pray about our services today and that they would pray and that they would set aside time and ask God to reignite faith for real because we can't do it. We can ask, but he's got to do it, yes? How did we get here though? Sin came in, right? And busyness came in. We used to walk with Jesus. We don't walk with him anymore. Our sin patterns, our sin lifestyle, media came in. Can I just pick on media for a second? Sure. And the binging of the TV shows and the Netflix, God bless it. And the movies and the social media. And the thing is, I'm not really picking on the media, guys. What I'm picking on is the hours we spend in front of it. Because it's, it's the way that we give ourselves to it, so much of ourselves, right? And it's like, it used to be we didn't know how much we actually were until our phones started tracking it for us. And if you actually want to look how much you're giving yourself to media, you can look at the number if you can face it. But there's this simple math that starts to happen to us as a people. The thing that we give ourselves overwhelmingly to, it shapes us. It can't not. And it's not telling us about Jesus. And it's not building up your identity and your self-concept in Christ. All that like counting and follower counting that we do and all that shaping of our narrative that we, we put out the greatest hits of our lives out in front of other people and hope that they like us. That's not helping us, guys. It's tearing us down. That's not what God wants for you. Like he, he did so much to give you an identity in Jesus Christ. You're made in the Imago Dei, in the image of God, and you matter in this universe because he said so, right? It's, it's the only like and follow that should matter. He said so, and that truth should so fill you and so give you strength and confidence that you're, spe you're, you're giving the love of Jesus to other people, and we don't because we feel low, because we've worshiped at a different altar. And I know it sounds like a lot, but wherever you're spending your most time, that is your altar. And Jesus wants to reignite the fire of your faith. Why did the fire go out? Matthew 19, verse 16. You might know this story. Someone came to Jesus with a question. Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? Why ask me about what is good? Jesus replied, there's only one who is good. But to answer your question, if you want to receive eternal life, keep the commandments. And then Jesus is about to give him the 10 commandments, right? Which ones the man asked? Jesus replied, don't murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. Must not testify falsely. Honor your father and mother and love your neighbor as yourself. Okay. Verse 20, I've obeyed all these commandments, the young man replied. Is he right? Heck no, he's not right. But he thinks he is. He thinks he's a good Christian doing his best, thinks it's enough. Jesus is about to answer him, what else must I do? Jesus told him, if you want to be perfect, go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. But when the young man heard this, he went away sad. Why? For he had many possessions. And it's not really that he had many possessions. It's that those possessions had him. They had him. You don't have your possessions. Your possessions have you. And that's the problem. A lot of, a lot of preachers come and they'll, they'll preach this, including me, by the way, will come and preach this and saying, Jesus isn't really saying you have to go and sell your house today. But he told this guy he did. 
Like that was obedience for this guy. Tough stuff. Why would Jesus give him such a high standard? Is it because he was in a fundraising mood? No. It's because he wanted this man to be free. Jesus doesn't need your money. He doesn't need your stuff. He wants you to be free of the way that it possesses you. We got all these things that possess us, have control of us. We think we've got control of them and we don't. Jesus wanted to disconnect the ownership, right? Like that's, that's the issue in our lives. In my family, um, and I've talked about this before, um, my grandfather was a, a, a World War II vet and uh, fought in the army in the European theater and came back with all of this, this stuff, you know, in his uniform and, and, and this knife and like, like all of these stories and documents and stuff like that. When he died, there was the big question of who does it go to? And they gave it to me and I made this big case and, and protect it and all this kind of stuff. And, 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 and the thing is, they didn't give it to me to own it. They gave it to me to take care of. They gave it to me so that I would protect it so that the family could have it. Amen. And what does that mean? That means I don't get to do whatever I want to with it, even though it's in my house. I'm responsible for it as a steward, the scripture says. I'm responsible for it. Whenever somebody calls up and says, cousin so-and-so wants to come over and see grandpa's stuff, the answer is not no. Absolutely. <laughs> and Linda knows like we'll have Christmases and stuff and everybody like piles around this case and wants to see grandpa's old stuff. Like we had a scare a couple years ago and there was a fire that was like a, literally a block away from our house. And, and they were calling us and saying, you, had, you got an hour to pack your little minivan with it, whatever you can hold before your house burns down. It didn't, thank God. But after Linda and the kids were in the car, okay, it was, it was grandpa's case. Yes, after, after. Did I say Before. No. <laughs> it's not about whether or not you have the stuff. It's about whether or not you've shifted over to God owns it all. And I just get to steward it. And when God shows up on a given day and says, I need that money. I need this part of your schedule. You might've started to believe it was yours and you got to make the calls, uh-uh. You might have thought that because you grew up with these beliefs, you get to stay in these old beliefs because they're comfortable for you. No, if, if you read my word one day and I show you what the truth is, you're gonna shift that over because I'm in charge of what truth is, God says. I'm in charge of what you believe. And that's what determines who's on the throne of your life. We've got a slide for this, the throne of my life. It's about my money my bedroom, my career, my family, my social life, my time and minutes and moments, my media use again, my dreams, my plans, right? My purpose and my beliefs. It's all of it. All of that is not my, it's his. And, and, and that, that subtle movement, it's not subtle at all. Does he have it or doesn't he? Because that's what was wrong with that man who wouldn't follow Jesus. He went away sad because he said, that's got to stay in the my column. That's the problem. A.W. Tozer said this, old pastor, he wrote down this prayer. It's a beautiful, he says, Father, I want to know thee, but my cowardly heart fears to give up its toys. I cannot part with them without inward bleeding. And I, I do not try to hide from thee the terror of the parting. I come trembling, but I do come. So please root from my heart all those things which I have cherished for so long and which have become a very part of my living self so that thou mayest enter and dwell there in my heart without a rival. Is there a rival in your heart? The next thing that pulls us and God apart is our sin. Isaiah 59 says this, listen, the Lord's arm is not too weak to save you, nor is his ear too deaf to hear you call. It's your sins that have cut you off from God. 
Because of your sins, he's turned away and will not listen anymore. Your hands are the hands of murderers. Your fingers are filthy with sin. Your lips are full of lies and your mouth spews corruption. It just creates distance, doesn't it? We're so into thinking that when sin comes in, it's about God considering us too dirty and he won't be in our presence. What he's trying to say here is it creates distance in our friendship, in our relationship. Because when you're choosing sin, it's just like those possessions. You're choosing them over me. And those will draw you away from Christ. And instead of me changing you into the image of who Jesus is, they're changing you into a very, very different image. That's not the way for you. That's not the way that things get better and you get blessed. And people walk around and say, I I tried Christianity and it didn't work. No, no. It's, there's, there's distance. Some of you guys have, have uh, read about David and David had his, his moment with Uriah and Bathsheba and he sinned against God and he cheated on his spouse and he murdered a man. And when he did, he wrote this Psalm, Psalm 51. And in that Psalm, he says, God created me a clean heart. And then he says, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. And you might be like, well, David, why didn't you just say, God, forgive me? Which he does. But why didn't you just say, God, forgive me and make me clean? What's this thing about the joy? Well, the joy always leaves when you're rebelling against God. And so does the peace. And so does everything else. Sin pulls you and God apart. And so does the busyness. Busyness makes you feel like you're not his. 1 John 2, 28, now little children abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. This is a huge verse for us today, huge. Two key parts there. He says, number one, you gotta abide in Jesus. And that's, that's some Bible terminology. And basically what it means is live in such a close relationship with Jesus. It's, it's like the whole praying without ceasing thing. It's like you have a friendship for real. So like in John 1, it says that when, when, when the logos came, when the son of God came, when Jesus came, he came and pitched his tent among us because he didn't want to be far away from a distance somewhere else. He wanted to be right in our midst. He wanted us to know him. He wanted us to walk with him. Like that's the whole thing. When we finally get to the book of Revelation, look at the last chapter. It says, at last the dwelling place place of God is with mankind. At last I get to live with them and them with me. And Jesus said in another place says, you got to abide in the vine and you got to abide in me the same way that I abide in the father. The, The same way that we're tight, the father and the son, you need to be tight with me. And then John comes along and says, when you don't abide, your confidence plummets as a Christian. That feeling that you're alive in God plummets. That sense that your soul is saved and alive plummets. Your confidence is lost. When I have a week and I'm not walking with Jesus and not sensitive to him and going my own way, the very first thing I feel is doubt the very first thing I'm going to feel is doubt about God. How are we? Because I feel like my soul's a bit dead right now. Some of you felt that. And there's been seasons where you've gone to this spot where you've questioned your salvation. You've questioned whether or not, did I actually mean what I said back here? Did God actually save me? And I will say most of the time, that's actually the enemy. Most of the time, that doubt is because you're not walking with Jesus anymore. One of the huge blessings of walking with Jesus is it does feel like your soul's alive. Amen. Confidence, and we're, we're meant to have confidence. Some of you guys used to walk with Jesus, and now you're ashamed that you don't anymore, and you don't know how to get back. Just ask him today. Ask him. Okay, so how do we give it all back to him? Romans 12, one gives us the answer. You just say, God, have it all. (laughs) Verse one, so dear brothers and sisters, again, it's talking to Christians. Please take that in. 
Brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. It, 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 he says, give your bodies to God. You're already a Christian. You're already saved, but you've still got to give yourself to God. And it's a choice. And maybe you used to make that choice, but you got to make it again. You got to draw a line in the sand and say, I'm his. And I love the imagery there. He's like, there's a sacrificial altar. It's time for you to get up on it. You're the sacrifice every single day. Is it because Jesus needs my pain? No. Jesus died for you, died for all of you once for all, the scripture says. So why in the world am I getting up on an altar? Because I got to die to my old self. Because my agenda and my possession of everything, it's got to die before I can be alive in Christ. And he says, be a living sacrifice. Be up there willingly, still alive. <laughs> Here's the problem. Getting up on an altar, being a living sacrifice, is we wiggle, do we not? We doubt and we wonder and we wake up tomorrow and we're not so sure anymore. And just ever so slowly, we start to wiggle. We want off of that altar and we step back off. And so let this verse today be a command to your heart right from the New Testament saying it's time for you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice again. Draw a line in the sand. Give yourself to God all over again. Amen. Okay, this is the re rededication moment. Would you stand? I have a lot to say still, but please stand. The prayer is going to be, God, you can have it all. If you want it to be. Rededication is this idea of I give God everything in my life and I decide today. They're almost like wedding vows, right? <laughs> you ever meet people who renew their vows? That's not a weakness, by the way. Some of us, we should, we should renew those vows about every year. Right? Sometimes our pride holds us back. Sometimes we need to redecide. Sometimes we need to remember why it was that we did this thing in the first place. Some of you guys have talked to Christians before, and they'll tell you the date that they were saved, and they'll tell you the date that they rededicated. Keep asking them, how many of those dates have you got? Some of them got a lot. But decide today. And you're like, well, how's this going to work in my daily life? And I've got all kinds of questions. Come back next week. Next week, we're going to talk about how to be sanctified into the image of Christ in your daily life. That's all next week. But today, you actually need to decide to surrender. And you need to decide to do it. Here's how this is going to work. Tanner's going to play a really long song. And you're not going to sing it with him. We aren't even going to put the lyrics up, just this prayer, because we want you praying. He's going to sing over you. But while he sings, I just want you to come to the front, and some of you are going to kneel, and you're going to surrender your life to God all over again, and it's going to be a massive thing between you and him. He is the only one who can supernaturally light spiritual fire in you again. you got to ask him to. Some of you, you should not be bending down because you won't get back up. You just stand here and that's perfectly fine. God respects that. I've asked the head usher to lock the doors. I have not. But sometimes we have services, guys, and we get to near the end of the service and people start walking around in the back and people got to leave and, and things like that. Um, I respect that. Some of, some of the needs are really real. Um, sometimes not. This is a holy moment. Please respect it. Um, we're going to keep the lights at a place that's safe. Um, the, we're going to have prayer teams in the back as well. Th this is just you and God. If you want somebody to support you in prayer, pray with you. Go to this back corner here, and they're going to pray with you back there. 
first service, we were two or three rows deep up here. I don't know how this is going to work second. Um, there's a lot of you. So he's going to sing a really long song. Did I say that? So let somebody else come up here and let, let them have their time with God. If there's no space for you, just sit patiently, wait for a spot to open up, and then you come up and you have your time with God. I just, very quickly too, if you've never been saved before and not surrendered your heart and life fully to Jesus Christ, I'm talking about rededication, and some of you are like, I never did it the first time. You can do both steps today. Give it all to Jesus. Do both steps today. If you've never been baptized, that was in the announcement video. December 10th, we're doing a baptism service. Let's, let's have the biggest one ever, guys. If you've never been baptized before, sign up today. Let that be part of your rededication with God, is that you're going to, you're going to obey Jesus and what he said about water baptism. One of my prayer warriors yesterday, <laughs> they wrote me a, a note and said, I'm praying for the new timers and the old timers. I liked that. Some of you have just, you've been a Christian for a very short amount of time. And you're like, is this even legal? Like, can I come back to God already? And it absolutely is. You new timers. Um, for you old timers, I just want to acknowledge that it's hard for someone who's a leader in the church or you're a leader in your family spiritually for you to come and acknowledge that part of the fire has gone low or gone out and I need this today, that's, that's a sacrifice for you. And we're just praying against shame, praying against pride and ego. Give that up. That's nonsense. You just come and do business with God that you need to do. Yeah. I'm going to pray. Let's pray. Jesus, I pray for power across this room, Lord. I pray that, that people would get this fire from you. Lord, I pray that as your Holy Spirit speaks to us, Lord, that you would help us to hear your voice, God, even if we've not heard you before. I pray, Lord, that you would bring convictions, that you would bring change, God, that you would bring courage into this space, uh, this holy space, God. Show up in all the ways we need you to. We love you, Jesus, in Christ's name.